the kind of stuck, there's an egregious condition of class. We go to them. Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon to those who are watching in the afternoon. I'm uh, Chancellor Murray Sinclair from Queen's University and uh, former senator, former judge. Um, and uh, I've been asked to talk to you a little bit today about um, the intention behind the use of the term reconciliation. What is it really intended to be about and how should we be using it? Uh, or how should we be understanding it? Uh, and let me begin by pointing out that the term reconciliation was not a term that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission itself came up with. Um, we developed an understanding about it, of course, but the term goes back to the first uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission that was created in South America in the early 1960s, but it was uh, more widely and internationally made known as a term uh, because of the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission led by uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Uh, when we looked at the you know, term as it uh, evolved over the years and as it had been used by those various other commissions, and there were some 60 other TRCs uh, around the world, um, we saw that the way that the issue of reconciliation was approached in the utilization of the term was um, different from one to the other slightly. Um, the, the term itself, I think, really meant to establish a peaceful relationship uh, or a new relationship or to uh, end uh, an era of, uh, of conflict between two peoples or more peoples. And the um, utilization of it depended often on the context. So in some parts of South America, for example, it was intended to address the fact that there had been armed conflict, armed resistance um, on the part of uh, groups against the government. And the term was used in order to negotiate a peaceful resolution to those armed conflicts. So it had a different usage in, in that context. And in addition, in the era of the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission, of course, we know that it was intended to address the uh, process of moving from an era of apartheid and the impact of apartheid into a more uh, peaceful coexistence between whites and uh, South Africans. The, um, the era had been, the era of apartheid had been uh, marked by some serious uh, violence that was taken against blacks by the South African government and um, to the extent that people were murdered, people were um, eliminated from existence through disappearances or um, kidnapped and sent elsewhere. So uh, the, the focus of their commission was really to try to bring uh, perpetrators and victims together in order to see if uh, the perpetrator himself or herself uh, and the victim of that perpetrator's acts uh, could uh, come to a peaceful understanding of things in order to avoid having to prosecute everybody who had committed a, a crime during the era. And um, it was because crimes had been committed on both sides and so it was to avoid having to go through the use of the criminal courts. In Canada, uh, of course, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was created in order to address the impacts of residential schools and uh, I think also intended to address the era of oppression that was created uh, following Confederation in Canada to force in indigenous people to give up their cultures, their languages, their lands, uh, and assimilate forcibly, if necessary, into Canadian society. The intention was, of course, to eliminate them as a separate and unique racial group, uh, with the intent being, of course, that uh, the government would thereby uh, find it more easy to uh, get access to their lands, to 
force them into urbanized settings so that their, the government's uh, support for their communities or um, need to support their communities could be reduced. Uh, and so uh, while the, the focus initially was on getting p indigenous people, First Nations people, to move from their broad territories onto smaller Indian reserves, ultimately the focus became to urbanize them. And, and so in the 1950s, for example, we see a policy of forced urbanization. Um, and, and so that was how the issue of um, the conflict uh, uh, resolved or evolved over the years. But during that time, of course, uh, some significant abuses occurred. Children were taken away from their families, often for no good reason, and placed into residential schools uh, forcibly to be assimilated. Uh, residential schools were publicly supposed to be about education, but very little education took place there. No child, for example, ever finished a residential school experience uh, and able to utilize that education in order to get into a post-secondary institution. Uh, often they'd have to go to a public school in order to get uh, a complete education so they could go to university or some post-secondary education program. Uh, so the schools themselves uh, really were not about education so much as they were about um, forced assimilation. And when you hear about the experiences of residential school survivors about the, having their hair removed, uh, having um, their skin bleached, having their c traditional clothing taken away from them, being forced <clears throat> to not speak their languages, um, being physically punished about that, often as well not even being allowed to speak to their brothers and sisters because then that would tend to um, permit them or cause them to speak their traditional languages. Um, visits to the schools were limited. Um, the government created, of course, the pass system. And uh, if a parent was going to visit a child in a school, they had to make certain promises before they'd get a pass in order to go to the school. Um, but the real intent, of course, was to uh, annihilate indigenous people as a unique cultural and racial group. And to that extent, uh, the actions of the government and Canadian society generally during that period fell very much within the definition of genocide as used in the United Nations Convention on Genocide as adopted in 1949, uh, which uh, included the force, forcible assimilation of uh, children uh, from one group into the culture of another group so as to eliminate their racial identity. And so the fact that it was a genocide was easy to conclude, uh, but the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Canada uh, was uh, required not to make findings of criminal wrongdoing, and that would have been a finding of criminal wrongdoing. So in our report, we refer to it as cultural genocide. Genocide not through the uh, killing of people, genocide through the forcible assimilation of people. And, uh, and so when you look at that, the question then becomes, if we're going to talk about reconciliation, we have to talk about it in the context of um, what we need to do in order to uh, allow indigenous people to regain their culture, to regain their languages, to regain their sense of identity. Uh, because it's only in doing that that indigenous people will be allowed to uh, revert to or to continue on their path of identity, on the path that was created for them initially that they were following and had been following for thousands and thousands of years before the arrival of European settlers, and one that they were most comfortable with, that certainly marked them to be a part of uh, an important group. But one of the things um, we have to keep in mind is that while the intention of 
residential schools had been to forcibly assimilate indigenous people into Canadian society, the racism within Canadian society was so strong that indigenous people never had a chance of ever being treated as equals. And so that lack of equality was also part of the reconciliation issue. And uh, dealing with the issue of racism is part of what reconciliation needs to be thought of here in Canada. And there are other aspects to it as well. Of course, reparations for what was taken and what was done, uh, reparations for the injuries that were caused, reparations for the loss of language, uh, recognizing that um, the terms of actions that governments need to undertake as identified in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples are an important part of uh, the reconciliation movement because the UN Declaration uh, itself was a focal point on reconciliation and so we refer to it in a number of our calls to action in the TRC report as um, an important part of what the reconciliation movement is about. And that is uh, the perpetrator, in this case the government of Canada, uh, taking steps to allow indigenous people to regain those things that the government itself took away or forcibly removed. Uh, and they must do uh, things uh, at equivalent cost and with equivalent effort to ensure that they can regain those things back. So the practice of their cultural teachings, the practice of their traditional teachings, their spirituality, their sovereignty over the lands that they have not properly surrendered or that have not been properly taken from them needs to be recognized. Uh, the courts are working somewhat to uh, recognize that aspect of reconciliation, but uh, there's a lot that needs to be done because Canadian society has been approaching reconciliation from the perspective that, well, as long as we admit that things were done wrong in the past or that injuries occurred and that proper compensation needs to be given, some lands need to be given back, uh, then we're good and we can just move forward. Uh, I've heard the expression often that indigenous people just need to get over it and move on. And the reality is that that's not an easy thing to do. And we shouldn't expect that easily to be undertaken by any group that has been so long oppressed. Eleven generations of indigenous people have experienced that oppression since Confederation and continue to experience it to this day because we still have not come to understand what it is that we must do to stop the systematic and systemic racism now that we have to face, not just the blatant racists, but also the unconscious racism, that systemic racism uh, so clearly involves. In simple terms, reconciliation ultimately is about this phrase, I want to be your friend, and I want you to be my friend, and I want us to see each other as equals, so that whenever I need your help, you will be there to give it to me, and whenever you need my help, I will be there to give it to you. And if we can think of reconciliation in those very simple terms, then it will help guide the actions that we need to follow going forward. It needn't be complicated, as complicated as we are making it, but it is something that will strike deeply at the way that this, company, uh, this, this country has evolved. So I hope that helps you in your thinking. Miigwech. <laughs>